This is um, a quote from Frederick Cook. He said, unless one has been in the Arctic, I suppose it is impossible to understand its fascination, a fascination which makes men risk their lives and endure inconceivable hardships. For as I view it now, no profitable personal purpose of any kind. 1913. <clears throat> so he, he was, I think you can turn the lights out now, Lynn. Yeah. He was, um, Frederick Cook was driven and he, he says this in his own book. There was a call to the Arctic and the Arctic within him that he couldn't explain. He, he couldn't put his finger on it. But when he, when he got put in an office, he got restless. And, and so he tried being a regular physician. Two to three years in, he would find an expedition and go off exploring Greenland, Alaska, the North Pole, and Antarctica. So we're just going to go through a general overview of some of his expeditions and um, also some of the reasons that I got involved, which there's a, because this is a local program, there's an interesting backstory to how a 55 year old organization felt to me, a 65 year old person from Vermont. And that's kind of interesting. If you know my background as a painter, I fell for the photography first. I was really just drawn to the photography. Then I began to learn about the man. And, and Frederick Cook is such an interesting character. I'm not the first one as I begin to meet more and more Frederick Cook fans who has just been charmed and entranced by this unique and crazy life that, that he lived. And it started, as most of you know, right here in Sullivan County. So let's um, go through some of the slides. Now this is, um, so this, he was very, am I still in the camera or how is this gonna go? Oh, well, that's okay. Fine. That's fine. These are just three separate portraits of Cook and, and um, there's a Canadian writer, Pierre Botan. If you were on the other side, you would, Oh, okay. If I was over here, it would be, but, but I've, this is my spot according to the, let me, how about this? No, I meant on the other side over there, they're saying. That's terrific. And am I still in That's the camera? Terrific. You don't have to be. Don't oh, worry about it. oh, no, excellent. Terrific. Okay. Thank excellent. Um, anyway, this Canadian writer, very famous Pierre Berton said, Cook was impossible not to like. He was gentle, he was personable, he was compassionate, and he had a magnanimous charisma that drew people to him. So these are just three different portraits of him that kind of show the different walks of life. Um, next. And also since we're in Sullivan County, I thought I would, show you his house in Hortonville. Mm -hmm. This is the house actually was Theodore's house as far as we know, although Frederick Cook lived here. It's right on Route 52. This is in the original day. This is how it is now. The porches have fallen off, but it's beautiful. Aldo and I took a tour. It's an absolutely fantastic house and it just happens to be for sale. So um, call me if you're interested. <laughs> The sled right here, these are the famous sleds made by Cook and his brother. They spent, from their childhood until late into their exploration career, they spent hours and years designing sleds to be faster, stronger, lighter. They used local hickory, local ash, and the story is over 200 of these sleds were built in Hortonville and sold to explorers all over the world. And that's just fascinating. He, he built to me what is like the BMW of sleds. And, and, and Perry drove a Buick, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Can you get the next? Thank you. So this is um, just a little more local history. That photograph is Cook's brother, Theodore Cook, the one that makes the sleds. It was just found last week, I mean, last month in the house in Hortonville, it was stuffed in an attic. And the owner called me and said, Carol, I have something that's gonna interest you. I mean, that's literally must've been in that house for a hundred years, stuffed in a corner up in the top. And this is a local newspaper article just from last month um, that talks about people from the from one of the big expeditions coming to Sullivan County to inspect the sleds that these guys are making. So, I mean, the sleds were why the people who believe Cook got there. He had better equipment and he spent countless hours making his stuff the fastest, the strongest, and he knew how to survive better than anyone. Next. And this, it's, a, it's not the best photo, but in our museum in Hurleyville, that sled is one of the most important pieces of Arctic history in existence. And I didn't even know what it was. It was in the museum and I saw it and I thought, well, that's a nice model. It turns out that sled was used by both Frederick Cook and Roald Amundsen, who discovered the South Pole that was used on the Belgica by both men. And um, they had five sleds on the Belgica, but this one survived. The story is Anthony Fiala, who was another explorer, had a store in Manhattan, and this was in his window for 25 years. And when he closed his store, somebody called the Cook Society and said, would you like this? So it's an absolutely extraordinary piece of history. Um, and this piece talks a little bit about Cook and Amundsen. And for those of you who don't know, Roald Amundsen is, is perhaps the most famous and um, well-respected explorer um, of this time. They were friends. They met on the Belgica. They didn't know each other, but trapped over winter on the Belgica for 13 months, they got close. And they spent a lot of time designing tents and sleds, snowshoes, and things that would help them survive. Next, like this. This is a very historic photo, and it's also gorgeous in person. Um, Cook designed the tent and the sled, and Amundsen designed the skis and the snowshoes. And um, the tent in particular is fascinating because a lot of Arctic explorers died from breathing their own breath. It would be so cold, the carbon dioxide would fall to the floor of the tent and they would suffocate. And so Cook learned from the Inuit to put holes in the sleds, I mean, in the, in the tents so that your breath could escape. And uh, so that's just an absolutely gorgeous photo, really, he staged things. He really cared about the composition and, and documenting his, um, his work as an explorer. It's a friggin' drawing, it, it is. And this, this is a little more about the sleds, and I'm not going to get into it, but it, it talks about how heavy and clunky Admiral Perry's sleds were, and they didn't carry as much weight. They really, he had these great big bulky things that were meant to sort of conquer but in in fact you know cook's little tiny sled with his two inuit went twice as fast and was twice as efficient and this is cook and amundsen um and this is where i'm going to talk a little bit about the belgica and for those of you who don't know the belgica was a belgian ship that um had a scientific mission, one of the very first scientific missions. It left for Antarctica. The plan was to drop off Cook and several of the scientists to do research there. They actually had a little hut on the boat. They were gonna live there and the boat was gonna to continue to Australia, except it didn't go that way. The, they, they, they played around along the way. I think you can do the next slide and um, ended up getting stuck. So 
many people believe that Cook's work on the Belgica was even more important than his um, trip to the North Pole. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Belgica, but I, I, I want to backtrack a little bit as to how I ended up here in this position. And, and um, it happened January 3rd, 2020. This letter came to the Sullivan County Museum to the Cook Society, and most of them were gone. There was two, two 89 year olds and really it had kind of gone away. It was just a bunch of files and photos and there was a gallery upstairs and a research library, but nobody was doing anything. So this letter came to me from Julian who wrote this best-selling book about the Belgica. And uh, the letter said, I'd like the Cook Society's permission to use photographs in my book because we still own the rights. So I found Pat Burns and some of the people that were involved, we got permission slips and I made a relationship with Julian uh, who wrote this book. And he actually came and gave a talk last year at our opening. He's a fascinating guy and a great writer, but let's go through the, the Belgica a little bit. This is, this is the Belgica, it's leaving Antwerp. 1897 and um, it was a big fanfare it was a huge event when it when it sailed out Belgium was very proud to have their first expedition uh, they didn't have enough scientists and sailors so interestingly enough it was staffed with scientists from all over the world Cook was the only American but there was French and Russian and Ukrainian and they didn't speak the same language so it's a fascinating group on the ship. There were, I think, 19 men to begin with. And um, so they started like that. And then this is, this is, this is a much more beautiful photo, but you can see as they begin to leave Antwerp, they're in the Daguerreloc Strait. This is 1898. Gorgeous. Everything is going well. <laughs> yeah. Um, they decided to stop in South America. Uh, Cook was very interested in ethnology. So they stayed probably too long. They, they had their cameras. Five of the men on the Belgica had cameras, which is fascinating. <coughs> and the ship had a dark room. Like all these great exploration ships had dark rooms, which is, this, that's the only way an explorer could get funded. He had to come back with evidence, photographs. So, these are a couple of Cook's photos and they don't show up as well in the slides here. Um, and there's the next one. This is one of his most famous images from Tierra del Fuego. These are Ona women. They have babies in their, in their fur hoods. And they are from a race of people that were between seven and nine feet tall. And they literally, the men wore almost no clothing and slept on the ice and ran through the woods chasing animals for food. They were absolutely just a wild species of people and Cook documented them. So we have a lot of photographs um, at the museum. I'm trying to get framed and get them exhibited that, that are just fascinating. And this tribe is gone. Sadly, European culture came in and they were eradicated through disease um, and other horrible ways. So you, you will never see these Ona people but, but Cook documented them and it's a very rare collection. And uh, we do have quite a few of them at the museum. So this is again on the trip there, the things got worse. This is their, they're heading towards Antarctica and you can see that that's just a photo and it's gorgeous in person of, of the, the cold ice that they're going into. And then, you know, ta-da, they're, they're stuck. They went too far. And um, the dark Antarctic night came over. There was three or four months of no sunlight and the men began to get very, very sick and very depressed. And the food they had was canned food. Cook had lived with the Inuit. He said, no. you need to eat raw penguin and seal or you're all gonna die. And they, it, it, it they didn't want to. Raw penguin and seal tastes a lot like 
cod liver oil dipped in motor oil. <laughs> it's really unpleasant. And he made them eat it. And one by one, they began to get better. He also conceived of what was called the baking treatment, where he made the men stand in front of a fire twice a day for an hour and absorb heat from the fire. To, so was to, it scurvy? That they it was scurvy. Okay. It was also depression. They, they, um, they had started to turn very gray. Their hair was turning gray and falling out. And it was really, they thought they were going to die. Every time the ice would shift, the ship would creak and the ship could have been broken up at any minute. So they're literally laying on a, this tenuous situation thinking, you know, any minute they could be dead. And, and something else that might've contributed to their demise, they had plenty of alcohol on board and, and Cook made them stop drinking because they were fighting and they were, it was making things worse. So he took away their canned food, he took away their alcohol and he made them exercise. He was really kind of the hero of this expedition. And um, as they began to get stronger, the sun began to come back and there was hope. They were thinking, okay, maybe we'll get out. So um, the sun came back, but this, this just an aside, these are pictures of Cook, Rakovita and Amundsen. And on the, on, on the left is before and on the right is after. So it, it just kind of shows you the effect of living in that environment. It's a really great photo of, of um, how they all just became completely sort of unkept and savage looking compared to their, this is a happy part of that story. They had made friends with a lot of penguins. This was one of their pets, an emperor penguin. And um, Cook photographed a lot of them. And apparently they didn't like killing them. They had to eat them to survive. And the penguins, they, would, they had instruments. They would play the mandolin. They would play the banjo and the penguins would come running. They were curious. And then, you know, they would catch them. But apparently if they played an accordion, the penguins ran away and jumped in their holes. <laughs> so, so that's a, and this was a sad moment on the Belgica. This was, Emile Danko was one of the scientists and very beloved. Uh, he had heart trouble, he did not survive. So the men in, in the dark of winter, you know, they dug a hole in the ice over here and, and he's on a sled and they had a funeral. They all went out there and, and held a funeral. I mean, it's 30 below zero, <laughs> really. That's, that's what we're dealing with here. So just a sad part. So anyway, the light comes back. The ship was not free and um, they began to get depressed again. Um, Frederick Cook conceived of a plan he said, we're gonna dig out. And you know, these were not big brutal sailors. These were scientists and educated kinds of people, but he made them get out and Amundsen got in on this and chop ice that was six feet deep. And they had to go probably half a mile to three quarters of a mile to get to open water. So they had a little dynamite, they had to make tools, they didn't have proper clothing but they got out there and started chopping. And uh, the first channel they got to the open water, they were pretty happy. They woke up, it had closed up overnight, gone. So that was tough, but they went back out and you know we can tell the story because they actually broke free and made it home. Uh, that's a, not a good photo of the, um, the flag from that ship, that's the Belgian flag, was presented to Cook and it's actually in our museum in Hurleyville and it's, it, it's also a precious artifact from that expedition. So let's move a little bit into the North Pole. This is, this is what most people know Frederick Cook for. And, and um, this is Cook's igloo with his two Inuit companions at what he claims is the North Pole. There's the American flag. Um, and for those who don't know the backstory, Cook and Perry, Perry was Cook's rival, another explorer, very, very competitive. 
they emerged from, uh, well, from Lerwick, it was telegrammed in Shetland, in the Shetland Islands, a week apart with messages that said, I got there first. I mean, just unheard of, two Americans, 300 years, man had been trying to get to the North Pole. Within six days of each other, these two both said, I got there first. And um, the media had a field day. Each respective newspaper picked up an explorer and began to champion that explorer. So Cook lost. He drew the short straw. He was poor. He didn't have connections. He was from Sullivan County. Uh, Admiral, you know, <laughs> Admiral Perry, on the other hand, he, his, he, he was friends with the president. He had connections to the National Geographic. He, he, he was connected all over the place and from a wealthy family. So they launched a media campaign against Cook that was brutal. And, and Cook being a, a sensitive and, and gentle soul left the country. He just didn't want to be around it. He tried standing up for himself, but surprise, surprise, the media would misquote him. You know, he just, he couldn't win because he didn't have the money to fight this powerful admiral and his, his influential backers. So Cook left, he went to Europe and he wrote the story of his, of his um, journey to the North Pole. And he thought, I'll present the book and everybody will believe me. But by then it was too late and they viewed his exit to Europe as a sign of weakness. They said, you know, he's, um, he, he can't face the competition, he ran away. So he really got crushed um, by Admiral Perry. So that's the backstory to the North Pole. And these are just some of the headlines. Um, the, the, you know, the story was reported by every major newspaper in the world. So I don't, you know, it's just fascinating. And, and, the, and the story was so huge. Every, the papers fought for years and years and years. And then it became, you know, Team Perry, Team Cook. People would be arguing in diners. They'd be arguing everywhere. And um, it, was, it was the biggest news in the world at the time. I guess then, a, you know, and this is, a little bit when when Cook, you know, he, they had a big reception for him um, when he got back to Belgium. He got to New York and he was kind of dreading it because he, he heard there's going to be another big reception for you. This is before Perry attacked him. Um, he announced that he had come from the poll. Thousands and thousands of people lined the streets of New York and he was celebrated. Reporters flocked to the ship. It was overwhelming. He, he did not do this for fame. He, he, he was driven, but he didn't really want all that attention. He, he said he had three or four days when he, he, he didn't have a minute to himself. He was just being barraged by the press. Um, yeah, 100,000 people lined the streets of New York and his name was on the lips of the entire civilized world. I mean, that's just fascinating to me. He was born right here, just a local guy. His father died when he was young. He liked to be outdoors, obviously. And, and he became one of the most famous people in the world. And, you know, he wrote four or five books about his trips and they're, they're so poetic and they're so well-written and, um, he was, he was just so abused by the media still. And this is the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I, in my most compassionate moment, I put up a good picture of Admiral Perry. Um, but let's go to the next slide because here's the, here's the real man. <laughs> this, is, this is Admiral Perry when he, you know, found out Cook got there first. And his story is so fascinating. He had actually been lost in Greenland, or they thought he was lost. And, and Cook and Perry were already sparring because Perry was very, very jealous of Cook's accomplishments. 
they couldn't find Perry. So his Arctic club came to Cook and said, would you go rescue him? And Cook said, yes. So he went all the way to Greenland and found him there. And his, he had lost eight toes, his toes were gone. And Cook said, you have to go, go home, you know, you're done. But Perry was very stubborn. He had his team of Inuits and his companions, they hauled him to the North Pole on a sled. And he didn't want that information out. He kind of hid that from the press. He was really dead weight um, on his trip. So I think he was twice as mad when he found out that Cook announced earlier that, uh, that Cook got there. There's a, a little backstory here. Admiral Perry had a black assistant and he was one of the best Arctic explorers ever to come out of the United States. He learned to drive the dog sleds. He spoke Inuit and he actually was the reason for Perry's success. He was with Admiral Perry for over 16 years and nobody knew about him. Admiral Perry did not include him in any of the press about his accomplishments. He was, you know, considered a manservant and yet he really was responsible for what success Perry had. He's, he's an amazing explorer. Um, and here's this, this is the map of Cook's route to the pole and back. And then this becomes a whole nother story. And um, Cook started down here in Anoatuk. Actually he started out of Gloucester, Massachusetts. And he, and he got to the pole on the way back, the ice had shifted. So he lost track, they cache food along the way, he lost his food. Um, he got stuck down here in Jones Sound because there was water and he couldn't cross the water. They had a canvas boat that got them pretty far. So when they would come across open water, you know, they'd load the dogs and the stuff into a canvas boat and go from iceberg to iceberg. But here they got stuck. They had to spend another winter uh, in an ice cave hunting local game. And um, so that Cook's book, Return from the Pole, is the first one I read. It's just absolutely fascinating. His story of living in this ice cave with these Inuits and, and hunting, they had almost nothing um, except, you know, the, the, the floor of their tent was the canvas boat and they had to hunt and it's freezing and it's very cold. But he eventually came out emaciated, nearly starving, and um, so he, in fact, got to the pole a year before Perry, but he didn't emerge till a year later, which is the week apart. Um, and these are just some shots I like. Cook in Denmark and in Copenhagen being, you know, greeted by the king of Denmark and just the reception that he got all over the world uh, for this accomplishment was enormous. And in New York. The Waldorf Astoria, uh, this was before Perry attacked him, but Cook is right up there sitting at the head table and all the dignitaries and politicians and explorers in the world that could get to this dinner were there to honor Cook. And this, this is an interesting photo because the Cook Society who, you know, I've read all their papers now and I feel like I know them, the, the ones that are gone, but this photo in particular, it's called Mending at the Pole. And it's one of Cook's Inuit uh, companions. They claim from that shadow is proof that Cook got there. Now I'm not by any means capable of verifying that, but they verified it. And these are, these are men who, and women, who studied the polar controversy for 30 or 40 years. The predecessor, the previous director, got his PhD in the Cook-Perry controversy. And he's written countless papers, which I love to read, but it, it's so technical. Like I can't tell from there that the shadows mean he was there, but they claim this is proof. Oh, so now we're going forward a little bit. That's a, that's a, you know, that's a lot. Um, coming up June 17th in Hurleyville, we're, I'm doing a little Cook symposium. And this is a book that will be released June 8th, Battle of Ink and Ice. 
And it was so fascinating. This guy, um, Daryl Hartman, walked into the museum and, you know, tall, young, good looking guy. And he said, I'm writing a book about the Cook Perry controversy. And I live in Livingston Manor. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, I, I just couldn't really believe it. But he had, he has a friend here and he had bought a second home in the manor and he had been doing research for years. And his story is unique. Um, he took the angle of researching every newspaper article ever written about the controversy. And he claims that they created the controversy. The whole, the media attention is what made the controversy. And so it's, a, it's an angle, you know, people blamed Cook or Perry, but so he's gonna be on June 17th in Hurleyville uh, to give a talk and sign copies of his book, which I haven't read yet. And also um, Ohio State University uh, holds a huge collection of Dr. Cook's artifacts that were donated there 25 years ago. And I've been working with their polar curator to get these pictures, they are all digitized. So she's become my friend. Ohio State University has never been to the Cook Society Museum. So she will also give a talk. And um, we're, gonna, we're putting up more photographs. So we're gonna have probably a hundred photos up and I might give it another little something, but it'll be a big reception and you are all invited. Um, these are just samples. They're kind of hard to see, but in the basement of the museum where the archives was, we found a box of 180 slides, negatives, and positives of Cook's time in Alaska, 1906-1908. So we're in the process of, of printing some of these, and I just sent some to our framer, and they're absolutely gorgeous. They, you know, they rival Ansel Adams in every way, in, in my humble opinion. And then uh, the next event is... Um, Patrick De Decker is a Australian professor and I met him, oddly enough, there was a phone call, a cold call at the museum, four in the afternoon. And it was the, the great granddaughter of Emil Rakovita who had been on the Belgica with Cook. And she said, I'm organizing a Belgica convention. Would you like to participate? So we did. And we met people from the Amundsen Museum. We met people um, from the Rakovita Foundation. And the, the Gerlachs didn't participate, but the, the Le Quant, I think, was there. So it was pretty interesting. Patrick de Decker has been, he's a scientist doing research on the Belgica, and he has uncovered a wealth of scientific data that was written in French. He's translated that French into English, he's putting it in a book, and um, he claims that research is relevant to climate change studies being done today. And that that particular expedition, the Belgica, brought back some of the most important scientific research that we've seen in this decade, or I mean, in this century. So he's, and he's coming all the way from Australia and he's touring a little bit around. So that's gonna be pretty neat um, in October. And I think this is where we get to the end. Um, that's just Cook wearing furs. He, as I said, he lived with the Inuit. He learned how to dress from the Inuit. He spoke Inuit. And one of his most endearing qualities was he loved them. And he, he was a physician. He would treat their kids. He would treat their, their ill. And they loved him too. He had a really strong relationship with them and even you know, there was some Inuit brought back by Perry that were left in the basement of the Museum of Natural History and Cook saved the ones he could and took them back to their homeland uh, in Greenland. Uh, so he's, you know, he was, he was a humanitarian as well as a physician, ethnologist, writer, and photographer. Is that a studio photo or is that a, a photo? Probably, yeah. Yeah, I think so. He set up a lot of his own work. He was, he was very image conscious. And um, he's, we have hundreds of photographs of him. So it's all part of his spiel. I think there's one more. Ah, I just wanted to thank you yeah. all for coming. Thank you, Donna, and the Time in the Valleys Museum.
Um, thank you, Carol. For coming. Yeah, who is, yeah, thank you.